Thank you, Brother Eddie, for those kind words. So very glad to be able to see everyone tonight. We're looking at an extremely interesting series of the world in crisis, and no doubt we do live in difficult times, and people are uncertain as to how the future will go. But as we go through this series, we will find that in every respect, the Bible has the answers. So we encourage you to intend all of these lessons that we'll be having in this series. If you're visiting with us tonight, certainly know this, that you are very much our honoured guest. As the 21st century unfolds, there is great concern about the environment. There's the cutting down of the Amazon jungles. There's the Indonesian slash and burn causing this haze in Singapore. There is the fracking in search of gas, and a lot of people are concerned about that and its effects on the environment. The safety of nuclear power is being questioned. There are oil spills. There is habitat loss causing animal species to become extinct. There is climate change, and the list seems to go on. Many of these are legitimate concerns that the excesses or the abuses of the present may have detrimental effects upon us or upon our children and our children's children as the future unfolds. But the concerned person's outlook concerning the environment and the proper use of the environment is one which will ultimately depend of one of two views which they adopt. One view holds that the God of the Bible created this world and created this world for mankind to live in to his glory. The second view holds that the world in effect created us and we are but subservient to it. These views, whichever view that we adopt, and it will tend to be one of the other, will radically affect our view of the world, our place in it, and our use of its resources. Which of these views that we take will affect our value that we place upon human life, our fellow man. And depending on which view we adopt, it will radically affect where we will spend eternity. In looking at the first of these views, there is the biblical view, the supernatural view concerning the creation of this world, that this world was created by the God of the Bible. As we would read in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. As we look into the scripture, we find that God is a spirit. Jesus said in John chapter 4 and verse 24, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Given that God is a spirit, he is not part of this material universe. Rather, he is of a separate nature, outside of and superior to this material universe. In somewhat of an analogy, it's a bit like saying the builder is not the building. He is made of different material than the building. He is outside of or separate from the building, and he is certainly greater than the building. We look into the scriptures and we find that God is intelligent. One of the great arguments for the existence of God is the teleological argument, which is a fancy name for just simply saying the design that we see in the universe bears witness that there must have been a designer. Certainly, as we look into the design of the human body, and that would be a lesson just in and of itself, we can see with all the intricacies of the human body that it certainly is not something that could have happened by chance, but rather just as we would look at a computer and conclude that it had an intelligent designer, so we look at the human body and also conclude the same. As we continue to look into the scripture, we find that God is all-powerful. God just spoke the universe into, the, into being. We would read in Genesis chapter 1 as we would scan through that chapter. And God said, let there be light. And God said, let there be a firmament separating the earth from the sky. And God said, let there be waters be gathered together. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb and the fruit tree. God just spoke it and these things happened. We cannot really imagine that kind of power that God could just speak the word and these marvelous things could just happen. Certainly, the creation stands as a witness that there is a creator. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. God is invisible, being a spirit. But that which God has done is that which God, that we are able to see and understand 
is an evidence of the fact that there is a creator. As we think then of man's place in the world, in light of the fact that the Bible teaches that God created the world, we see that God created man as a living being. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. God gave life to man just that he is, as he's saying as he gave life to plants and to animals. The Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 17 verses 24 and 25 said, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that his Lord of heaven and earth dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing that he giveth to all life and breath and all things. Outside of the Bible, no one can give an adequate explanation to the origin of life. Even world famous atheist Richard Dawkins hasn't a clue how life came about on earth. He says maybe the aliens did it, begging the question, well where did the aliens come from? And you can chase the aliens all around the galaxy, they must have come from somewhere. No one can give an explanation outside of the scriptures of how life came on this earth. We also read in the scripture that God created man in his likeness. In Genesis chapter 1 verses 26 and 27, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. God is a spirit. So when this passage says that God made man in his image, it's not to say that God has hands and ears and eyes like we have, but rather there is a spiritual component that God has put into man that is in his likeness. Unlike animals, man has been given an immortal soul that once brought into being, God being the father of spirits, it does not go out of existence. Also like God, we are moral beings. We have the power to know and to choose between right and wrong, good and evil. The message of the Bible is of a righteous God redeeming a sinful man back to himself. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So we've been given the power to choice, to choose. We have chosen to disobey God. God in love is wanting to bring us back to him. And so we understand as we look in the scripture, thank you, as we look into the scripture, that man created in God's image is very much loved by God. The universe it was created by God as an environment for mankind to live in and to prosper. The majesty of the creation is to bear witness of the greatness, the power and the reality of the invisible God. Even the, the moon and the stars were created as signs for our benefit. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 14 and God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the night, day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years, for our benefit. We learn that this world, created by God, is to a very large degree a robust, self-regulating, self-repairing system for us to live in. Mankind will not destroy this world. We have the assurance of God that that is the case. In the aftermath of the great flood of Noah's day, in Genesis chapter 8, verses 21 and 22, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, neither will I again smite any more every living thing, everything living, as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. So it is not man that is going to destroy this world. Rather, we learn as we look at Scripture that when God's purposes have ceased, when the Lord comes back to judge the world in righteousness, then this world will come to an end. As we would look in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10, a passage that we're going to refer to a little later in the lesson. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So it is God who created this world for us to live in. When his purposes are finished, it is God that will take this world out of existence. As we think about what the Bible teaches concerning the creator God, 
and man being placed in this world, we understand that we have a responsibility toward the world that the Lord has placed us in. We have been given dominion over this world. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 28 and 29, Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, speaking to that first human pair. Fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food. The word dominion there simply means to have rule or authority. About 1600 years later, this, this command was repeated. Again in the aftermath of the flood we read, So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, and the fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth, on every bird of the air, and on all that move on the earth, and on all the fish of the sea. They are given into your hand. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs. With this in mind, that man has been given rule or authority, we do understand, however, that the ultimate ownership of this world still belongs to God. The psalmist would say in Psalm 24 verse 1, The earth is the Lord's and in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. Again, from Psalm 50, verses 10 and 11. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. To illustrate it, it is like a, a father buying for his son a brand new car. And this, son is given, this car is given to the son for his use. And he has responsibility for looking after the car. But nevertheless, the ultimate ownership of the car still remains with the father. It follows then that how the son would use the car for what purposes, how he takes care of the car, is a reflection of the respect that he has for the father who has given him the trust and the use thereof. In a similar way, the world is the Lord's and how we use it given that we have been given responsibility to rule and have dominion over this world, is a reflection of our respect for and our gratitude toward the God who gave it to us. Man is also to recognize that God cares for his creation. In a couple of passages where Jesus is highlighting just how valuable we human beings are, Jesus would say in Luke chapter 12, verses 6 and 7, Are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins, and not one of them is forgotten before God? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. And again from Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 to 30. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you, of not much, are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his statue? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? As I say, in these passages, Jesus is bringing out just how valuable we are in the sight of God. But he does it by highlighting the care that God has over his creation. We also understand that man, as we look into the scripture, is to tend and develop profitably this world. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend it and keep it. The word tend there means to, to work or to cultivate. So approved of by God, as we look into the scripture, are things such as agriculture, animal husbandry, forestry, fishing. We think of Jesus' apostles, many of them were fishermen. But also approved of by God are things such as mining, metallurgy, manufacturing, technological development. In one of the genealogies in Genesis chapter 4, verses 20 to 22, we read, And Adabor Jabal, he was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the harp and flute. As for Zillah, she also bore Tubal Cain, an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and in iron. Notice there that we have animal husbandry, we have the manufacture of musical instruments, and we have an individual there 
that would mine for metal and he would form that metal into useful objects. So we see as we look into scripture that man has God's approval to use this world's resources for his nourishment and well-being. But as we continue to look at the Bible, we also find that we are to use those resources responsibly. Man is not authorized to act in a careless, wanton, or an inconsiderate way towards this world's environment. As far as possible, we are to use resources on a sustainable basis. We would read in Leviticus chapter 25, verses 1 through to 5, that when the Israelites went into the promised land, they were to cultivate the land for six years. Then on the seventh year, they were to allow it to have a Sabbath rest. In other words, it was to lie fallow. It was not to be cultivated. It was not to be pushed to produce crops. This enabled the ground to recover so that it again would be able to produce in the years to come. This is a technique that was used for centuries of allowing the ground to be cultivated for so many years, lay fallow in order for the soil to replenish itself before again being cultivated. We see in Deuteronomy chapter 20 verses 19 and 20 instructions given concerning the people when they wage war against a foreign city. When you besiege a city for a long time while making war against it to take it, you shall not destroy its trees by wielding an axe against them. If you can eat of them, do not cut them down to use in the siege, for the tree of the field is man's food. Only the trees which you know are not trees for food you may destroy and cut down to build siege works against that city that makes war with you until it is subdued. In other words, if you're going to build siege works against this city, use the trees that are not fruit trees or nut trees. Because if you chop those down, the food trees, you are depriving yourself of future resources, of future food source. We would find as we would look in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 6, if a bird's nest happens to be before you along the way, in any tree or on the ground, with young ones or eggs, with a mother sitting on the young or on the eggs, you shall not take the mother with the young. You shall surely let the mother go and take the young for yourself that it may be well with you and that you may prolong your days. In other words, what the Lord here is saying is that if you find a mother bird on her young or upon her eggs and you take them both, you may get one, maybe two meals and that's it, it's gone. But if you just simply take the young and you let the mother go free, then you are ensuring a future supply of food for yourself. We find that, as again we look into the scripture, this is the biblical view of the world and the environment, that man is to be considerate of other life. We're told in Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 10, a righteous man regards the life of his animal, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. We think of what's written in the book of Deuteronomy concerning having two animals yoked together in order to do work. And we read there, you shall not plough with an ox and a donkey together. Now, spiritual application will be made of this passage elsewhere in the scripture. But when we think about it in a practical level, if you have two animals which are mismatched, it is going to be cruel to both of them and unproductive as far as you are concerned. When we think of animals that might be used for food or for provision, even then, we are not to be cruel to animals. Look at how Jesus described himself in John chapter 10 and verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Now, a shepherd keeps sheep in order to gain their wool or perhaps to have them for food or in Old Testament times for sacrifice. But nevertheless, Jesus is saying the good shepherd looks after the well-being of those in his care. So therefore, whether animals are used for burden, transport, food, or to whatever use for man's well-being, they are not to be treated wastefully or cruelly. For as we go back to that passage in Proverbs, only the wicked would do so. We also learn that man is to treat others as he would be treated. In Luke chapter 6 and verse 31, And as you would that men should do to you, do you also to them likewise? Sometimes we refer to that as the, the golden rule. Applying that rule then means that our use of natural resources is not to willfully harm others. 
So burning forests and causing significant harm to others would be a violation of this rule. Polluting waterways or someone's farming land would be a violation of this rule. Keeping to this rule, man does not use the resources of others without permission or adequate compensation, nor does he deliberately take from future generations for greedy short-term gain. As we look then at this biblical view of man and the environment that God has made for us, Christians acknowledge that God is the creator. The supernatural God of the Bible is the creator. They also understand that this wonderful world has been created for mankind's benefit and prosperity. It is within that context that the Christian believes that man's proper use of the world and its resources is a way in which we show respect toward our creator. And we are concerned about the proper use of the resources of this world. Now I mention all of this because the modern day environmental movement would have us believe that they're the only ones that are concerned about this environment and if we're concerned about the environment we need to join up with them and their way of thinking, their view of the world. Which brings us to the second world view and that is the natural view. According to this view, and this is the view which undergirds the modern day environmental movement, there is no supernatural God. The universe is the result of purely natural processes. Humanist manifestos are somewhat creedal documents that humanists, which is a polite term for atheists, which is very much part of the thinking, as I say, of the modern environmental movement. Humanist manifesto number one says, humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not created. They believe that life is the result of chance evolutionary processes over billions of years. And humanism believes that man is a part of nature and that he has emerged as a result of a continual process. So we have evolved from basically the stuff of this universe. According to their thinking, there is no design, purpose or value to human life. As Harvard professor George Galen Simpson said, man is a result of a purposeless and materialistic process that did not have him in mind. Again, from one of the humanist manifestos, the nature of the universe depicted by modern science makes unacceptable any supernatural or cosmic guarantees of human values. Now, what does all this mean? In looking at the implications of this natural view, which is very much, as I say, part of the modern environmental movement, this life and all that there is and this planet is the absolute substance of our existence. There is no supernatural deity that has created us. This world and all that's therein is the entirety of our existence. Given that the universe, according to their thinking, is here without any purpose and that the favourable environment of the earth that we currently enjoy is nothing more than the result of chance, fortuitous accidents, it then follows that life has evolved by chance processes. And things that are done by chance tend to be very fragile. And so in their thinking, it follows that the planet is a very fragile and a misstep on mankind's part could very much see life exterminated or this planet seriously harmed. According to their thinking, their God, if we would term it a God, is the planet Earth. Man is incurably religious. There is no race or culture of men in which there does not exist a religious faculty. And though his religious beliefs may be very corrupted, man's religious faculty is in fact an evidence for the fact that there is a God and man wanting to seek some higher power, no matter how he may conceive that higher power to be. If man does not worship the true and living God of the Bible, he will worship something of this creation. As the Apostle Paul would say in Romans chapter 1, verses 20 to 25, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. 
Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and to four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their heart, own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. They changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. In days of old, even as it is in some places today, it was idols of wood or stone representing deities, certain nature deities that people would often bow down before. In time past, we read about a couple of these deities in the Old Testament, the Baals and the Ashtaros, that people would bow down to their images. And God certainly had a battle trying to get the people of Israel to look to him and not to bow down before that which was of this creation. We still have vestiges of this nature worship in the expression of Mother Nature today. It refers back to this pagan concept of the earth being God. Nature worship is still found in animistic societies today, such as the Australian Aborigines, the Af some African tribes, the North American Indians. And they have this concept that in the, the rocks and in the trees and in various places, there are certain spirits that occupy those places. And so this is very much this nature worship. Today's radical environmental movement, we might call them the Greens, is a renewal of the pagan worship in an increasingly post-Christian Western world. And what tends to go on in the Western world, because it is such a great culture shaper, if you wish, tends to influence many other people far and wide. Michael Crichton, Dr. Michael Crichton, who was a doctor who became an author, gave us such TV shows as ER and Jurassic Park, in speaking of modern environmentalism, he said, Today one of the most powerful religions in the Western world is environmentalism. Environmentalism seems to be the religion, cho religion of choice for urban atheists. So I draw the connection in your minds back to those humanist manifestos that I was quoting earlier. These are the, if you like, ethical statements of the atheist and of today's environmentalist. According to this neo-pagan view, the earth is a creation to be honoured and respected as our mother from the group Friends of the Earth. Bolivian Vice President Alvera Garcia Linera said, Earth is the mother of all. In a Bolivian draft law as they were drafting a new constitution, in their concept of this mother earth, they put in their draft law, she is sacred, speaking of the earth, fertile and the source of life that feeds and cares for all living beings in her womb. She is in permanent balance, harmony and communication with the cosmos. She is comprised of all ecosystems and living beings and their self-organization. In popular culture, this kind of nature worship, this pantheistic concept of God or deity that's created by the natural things of this creation are promoted by movies such as the Star Wars films, think of The Force, or of blockbuster movies such as Avatar. Today's green movement rejects completely the supreme personal God of the Bible. Understand, they may give lip service to the God of the Bible, but they certainly do not in any way affirm the God of the Bible. Now the implications of this natural view are that man is just an animal among animals. We've evolved just as other species have done. And as a result of that, we have no greater worth than any other life form. Dr. Eric R. Pianka, who was awarded Distinguished Texas Scientist of the Year in 2006, stated, we are no better than bacteria. John Davies from the group Earth First said, human beings as a species have no more value than slugs. This was brought home to me, just how much this thinking has actually permeated the thinking, particularly of the young. When I had a, uh, we had a young lady, she was probably about 15 years of age, she came visiting with us, uh, came along with her boyfriend, she came visiting with us uh, one evening. And I had a conversation with her, and as the conversation unfolded, she affirmed 
that we as human beings have no more value than a cow. As man is just an animal, with, then it follows that according to this way of thinking, there is no objective moral standard which raises us above the animals, which is why those of the Green Movement are pro-homosexual and all forms of consensual sexual behaviour in their view is to be permitted, be it incest, polygamy, polyamorous relationships, transgender. Abortion and euthanasia are to be encouraged. Divorce is to be permitted. And the list goes on of their ungodly moral standards. According to this view, man has no real purpose or hope for the future. Famed atheist Richard Dawkins said, you are for nothing. You are here to propagate your selfish genes. There is no higher purpose in life. You are here to breed, and that is the sum total of your purpose of existence. Humanist Manifesto number two said, There is no credible evidence that life survives the death of the body. We continue to exist in our progeny and in the way that our lives have influenced others in our culture. Now, we need to understand what they're saying is that once you're dead, that's it, you are gone. You've had children, that's fine, that's your influence for the future or something that you may have done during your life that's had an influence on other generations. But as far as you are concerned, you have gone out of existence. According to the natural view of the world, man is a plague on the planet. Dr. David Grabber a U.S. National Park Service biologist said, we have become a plague upon ourselves and upon Earth. Until such a time as Homo sapiens should desire to rejoin nature, some of us can only hope for the right virus to come along. Prince Philip, the Queen's consort, former president of the Worldwide Fund for Nature said, in the event that I'm reincarnated, I would like to return as a deadly virus in order to contribute something to solve overpopulation. Dr. Eric Yanker that I referenced just a few moments ago, he was advocating that perhaps some kind of airborne strain of Ebola would be something that would be to the advantage of the world, reducing the world's population down to just only 10% of what it currently is. And he was given a standing ovation for that statement. Those brave men and women that lost their lives in Africa last year fighting against Ebola as far as he is concerned, we're doing a disservice towards this world. But this idea that we're being sold, that man is just a plague upon the world, it just doesn't stand up to the facts. If we were to take a dog, a wild dog, and put him in a field with 10 sheep, within a year, in much less than a year, you would have no sheep left. But if you give a man 10 sheep, within a year he's probably going to have 30 or 40 sheep and some of them he would have already taken and used to feed his family. In fact, the number one health concern in the developed world is obesity. Too much food. And in fact, I was somewhat surprised to read that even in some African countries, obesity is becoming a problem. So rather than man being a plague upon the planet, we find that man using resources responsibly in accordance with biblical principles is actually very productive and we can support much more population than what this world currently has. Again, as we think about the implications of the natural view of the world undergirding the modern environmental movement, it says that the earth is a very delicate system that man can ruin. In their view, paradise is a world untouched by human activity. And to give you an illustration of how popular that is, if any of you have seen the Noah movie, which as a movie is just a disaster, don't spend your money, but it's a movie that basically advocates that sin is man's use of the natural resources and God was going to wipe out man because he was using the natural resources of the world. According to this view, man's activities can only be tolerated if they have the lifestyle and <clears throat> animistic religious philosophy of the Australian Aborigine or the North American Indian. I suppose as many of you have thought on a lesson on environmentalism, what about climate change? The alarmism of man-made global warming 
is predicated on the assertion that man's industry is able to upset the delicate balance of nature and bring about worldwide catastrophe. Now I'm not going to go into all the ins and outs about climate change because that would have to be a lesson, maybe even a couple of lessons in and of itself. But I want you to take away five things to just have a bit of a think about with regards to all the alarmism that we are pretty much universally exposed to through the media. Number one, greenhouse gases are not intrinsically bad. You get the impression that greenhouse gases, it's got to be bad. We need greenhouse gases. If we did not have greenhouse gases to keep some of the sun's rays or some of the sun's warmth on the earth, it would radiate back out into space. And as a result of that, the earth would be subjected to extremes of hot and cold making existence of life on earth marginal. We also need to understand that CO2, carbon dioxide, they call it carbon because that sounds more dramatic, but carbon dioxide is only one of a number of greenhouse gases. Many others are not even being considered. Do you know what the world's largest greenhouse gas is? Water vapour. And no one's taking any note of just how much water vapour we have. Man's industrial activity is not the sole cause of changing the world's climate. We need to understand that climate is weather patterns as viewed across decades or centuries. Climate's not measured by how hot or cold it was last year or even the year before. It is something that has to be looked at across the decades, indeed even across the centuries, to get an understanding of what the climate is in a given area. The climate is always changing. We find that we have had a shift in the expression from global warming to climate change because you look pretty silly talking about global warming when you come from a place like I do in Tasmania where we've just had our coldest winter for 50 years. So they call it climate change because who can, den who can deny that the climate is changing? Whichever way it goes, they can hedge their bets and still keep on bringing about this alarmism. But evidence that the climate is always changing is found in such things as the remains of forests found in Greenland and the Antarctic. In fact, I've heard that some of the world's largest coal deposits are to be found down the Antarctic. And if you know anything about the formation of coal, it comes from decayed vegetable matter. There was the medieval warm period from the years 950 to about 1250. About 300 years, the world's environment was warmer than it had been at other times. And the Europeans particularly wrote about the warmer environment and the fact that their production of crops was so much greater. This was then followed by the Little Ice Age, which went from 1300 to 1850 AD. And in fact, when you have people talking about global warming, they'll always start from 1850 because that's the end of the Little Ice Age. There was great concern in 1923 of a new ice age coming about. So you had this ice age, things started to warm up, then there was concern that we're going into a new ice age. Then in 1932 there were concerns about melting ice caps. Does that sound familiar to some of the stuff that we're hearing today? In 1970 Newsweek magazine and even the CIA were concerned about global cooling. So only 40 odd years ago, they were concerned that we were going to have a planet that was much cooler. And do you know where they're laying the foot of the blade? Man's industrial activity. It's going to cool the planet. In 1974, Time magazine, in an article on June 24th, said, whatever the cause of the cooling trend, its effects could be extremely serious, if not catastrophic. Does that sound similar to some of the things that we're hearing today? It's just that this time we're on global warming. We also need to understand thirdly that carbon dioxide is not a pollutant. Carbon dioxide is a trace gas comprising only 0.03% of the atmosphere. In fact, carbon dioxide is vital for plant life. Without it, life on Earth would be impossible. The plants would die, we would have nothing to eat, and we would be gone a short time later. Since the Industrial Revolution, the concentration of CO2 has gone from 280 parts per million to 400 parts per million. 
And people talk about that, and they get alarmed, they get concerned, and they say, look, we've got this tremendous growth in carbon dioxide, so carbon's a pollutant, we need to reduce our carbon footprint. Let's put this in perspective. If we were to imagine 10,000 molecules of atmosphere, and I've only been able to manage to put about 7,000 on the screen, but if we imagine 10,000 molecules of atmosphere, before the Industrial Revolution, 2.8 were carbon dioxide. That little one there represents the 0.8, almost three. Now, we have four. And as a result of this, ice caps are going to melt, sea levels are going to rise, and basically life on Earth is going to be radically changed. Most greenhouse gases are produced by natural means of which man's part is small. Scientists are now concerned, and I kid you not, they are now concerned by the amount of methane that cows give off. According to a United Nations report, cows give off 18% of the greenhouse gases that supposedly cause global warming. So it's all these cows that are the ones that are causing the problems with the environment. And what they give off in terms of greenhouse gases is more than cars, planes and all other means of transport combined. Apparently this concern about what animals can do has a precedent because some British scientists are saying that flatulent dinosaurs are what changed the environment of their day and wiped them out. Velociraptors love beans, who knew? But that's what kind of nonsense that we're being subject to. And lastly, and these are just five points to help you to perhaps look more critically at some of the statements that are actually being put out concerning this. Certainly, no one is denying that we should look after the world, that we should reduce pollution as much as possible. Absolutely, we should. But as we talk about climate change and the alarmism that has been generated by it, we need to understand there is much about the Earth systems that we do not fully understand. And this is more than what the radical environmentalists would like to give credit for, that this world is more robust than what they would like us to think. And that is consistent with the fact that the God who created the universe has created for us a world, he's created for us an environment which is going to well suit mankind until God's purposes are fulfilled. As we think about what we've examined tonight, there are two worldviews with regard to man and his environment. Both of these views value the environment, but their values and view of humanity are diametrically imposed. The natural view holds that the universe has no supernatural, natural or personal creator. That this universe and the earth is a result of purely natural chance processes. The earth, in their thinking, becomes the God that we should worship and the giver and sustainer of life. Now let us understand this. If the earth is said to be God, this Gaia concept named after the Greek goddess for the earth, then it is a cold, unfeeling and an uncaring deity. To it, we're being asked to sacrifice our children's future and our desire to use its resources and energy for the welfare and nourishment of eternity. And as we think of the natural view of the world and its concept of our future existence, to hold to it, we must also sacrifice our eternal soul. According to their thinking, man has no value, even that over the bacteria and the slugs. As George Gaylord Simpson said, man is the result of a purposeless and materialistic process that did not have him in mind. We are nothing more than parasites living on the face of Mother Earth. According to their view, man has no future eternal destiny. We have no hope beyond the grave. Like the animals, we live and die and the stuff of our physical bodies is recycled back into the earth as part of the new age wheel of life. And they're thinking this world is our only home. Paradise for them is an earth free from human activity. At best, it would reduce mankind's activities to that currently being experienced in third world economies.
And to those that are in such economies, it would lock them into their current poor standard of living. Whilst the environmental movement cares for the environment in the sense that it doesn't want things to be spoiled, it is selling much more than what we actually want to buy. On the other hand, the supernatural view holds that there is a creator. And this is, in fact, in accord with the actual facts of science. The God of the Bible, he's a spirit, he's all-powerful, and he is personal. He knows each one of us, and he wants each one of us to have a relationship with him. According to the Bible's view, God loves us, and we are the pinnacle of his creation. No slug, no cow, no bacteria. We have been given an immortal soul made in his image, and we are very important to him. The world and all living things is given for our welfare, our nourishment, and our prosperity. Whilst we are to be careful with what the Lord has given us, not to callously abuse or misuse what God has created, we are not to, we are not to be reluctant to use what God has given us appropriately for our well-being. Our future does not lie with this present world. Rather, our future lies either with God in heaven or in our sins in hell. This is what we are to be preoccupied with, where we will spend our eternal destiny. We are to heed the message of the Bible and accept God's offer of salvation of sins through Christ. Living life then in the here and now to God's glory to worship the true creator, not the creation. This world created for man, it's not independent of him. Rather, when God's plan for redeeming man comes to an end, so will this world. And so we revisit 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, and look even more. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in a whole, holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat? I don't want to be facetious, but this is the global warming that we need to be concerned about, where we're going to be on that day the Lord returns. The message of the Bible is of God wanting to forgive us of our sins. And he's made the way for us to be forgiven through the sending of his son Jesus to die for our sins. Our earthly body will pass away, but our soul will live on. That gives us hope for the future, but it also reminds us of our responsibility in the here and now to make sure we make the right decisions so that we can accept God's offer and we can spend eternity with him. If you have been thinking about what the scriptures teach and you want to make your soul right with God. God deeply desires for you to acknowledge him as the creator, to see his son Jesus as your savior. God wants you to turn from your sin and in turning for your sin to make a commitment that you're going to live for the Lord. He wants you to confess the name of Christ, that you believe that he is the son of God and he wants you to be baptized because in being baptized, then God takes away your sin. And then to live the remainder of your days, however long that will be, in a way that is pleasing to God. And know that you have the assurance of an eternal future with him in heaven. The consequences of not making that decision are too grave to just dismiss it. God loves you. God cares for you. If you would like to receive the forgiveness of your sins, that can happen this very night. If you are a Christian and you would like the prayers of the church to help you to get back into a right relationship with God, to get your focus back onto truly spiritual things, perhaps you've been caught up with the thinking of this world and been distracted from truly focusing upon the true creator. We're here to pray for you. We're here to assist you in any way we can as we stand and as we lead in our closing song.